happens. We begin a new series today called Redefining Faith. We're going to be looking at the book of Hebrews, in particular Hebrews chapter 11. So the common question that would come from this title is, why does faith need to be redefined? Now, one of the things with faith is it's a very pivotal part of the entire Bible. As I studied it this week, it's used over 500 times with a, a prevalence to it. It's not just like an adjective. It's really used as a symbol, as a foundation stone of our belief system. Now, if you were to ask a believer, how would you define faith? Most of them would say it's belief, it's trust. And I remember as a young boy, I was given the verse, Hebrews 11, chapter 1. Let's just turn there together right now. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. I asked, what is faith? And I was pointed to this verse. It says this, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. And I remember reading this as a young boy, and I felt like I finally got clarity, and then I read it again. I felt just as confused as when I first read it. See, there are these verses that we point to to try to bring clarity to what faith actually is. But in result, we get lots of weird definitions and weird beliefs. And what happens is culture tends to define faith for us. Where faith right now is just simply a religious belief. And then you look as to what faith is and you come across really bad quotes as to what faith is. Try to explain faith. Just a few of them I came across this week. Faith is like a radar. That helps you see through the fog. I don't know if that's the original intention of the author of Hebrews. Another person wrote this. I'm engaged to my faith. Now I can marry my dreams. No, thank you. My favorite was this, though. Here's actually a slide for it. Faith is like Wi-Fi. It connects you to what you need. This is not the intention of any writer throughout the Bible. To have these weird cultural assessments as to what faith is. And what we tend to do is we make faith really complicated. We really are good at complicating what faith is, and we have to understand who the Bible was being written to. Many that were uneducated, many that did not go through scholarly programs on how to interpret different passages of Scripture. We've made faith so complicated when it's an invitation into relationship with the living God. So he gives us this invitation, and again, we try to define faith or see how do we live faith out? How do we make it more than a definition, but something that we live out in result? And one of the common verses that we tend to quote, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight, right? And as a result, the common image of living a life of faith is we're called to take a leap of faith. That's the image that we commonly have. That faith is this leap that we have to take. But how many know that our journey of leaps of faith don't look like this, but often look like this? <laughs> That's the honest experience a lot of us have. Is we see this cliff in front of us and we say, God, I trust you. But it feels like we're falling in the process of this journey of faith. Now, the main image I believe that God uses for us, other than children, is sheep. And we've talked about this many a times. Pastor Bob and I have gone back and forth about the intelligence of sheep. I was convinced that sheep were dumb. He was convinced that sheep were smart. And I watched this odd culinary documentary where they talked about the nature of sheep. And this is what I found out. It finally came to a head here. It said that the reason why a lot of us think sheep are dumb is because sheep in the U.S. are domesticated. Sheep worldwide are wild. So domesticated sheep become dumb and dependent on the feeding system, and they become extraordinarily lazy. However, wild sheep, those that, are, again, are shepherded in the wilderness, listen to their shepherd's voice, and that's really the context of the sheep of that time. However, even though sheep are seemingly intelligent in the wild, they still do dumb things. And in 2005, there was a group of shepherds in Turkey on a mountainside. They had 1,500 sheep. As they had this pattern done many a times, there was one rogue sheep that started to walk and started to wonder. It wandered to the edge of a cliffside in which other sheep started to follow. It then proceeded to jump off the cliff to its death, followed by another sheep and another sheep and another sheep. 1,500 sheep jumped off this cliff. Now, in result, you would think all these sheep would have died. Only 400 died because they then supplied this giant sheep pillow that the other 1,100 jumped onto. Now, this really is a picture of what a lot of our faith journey looks like. 
Some of us see someone take this leap in which we follow and are gravely injured in result. Others of us try faith and are left underwhelmed and confused. We jump into this and we're like, nothing really happened. I don't really understand what took place in result. And faith ends up becoming something we try rather than something that we live. Faith is something that we use on occasion. It's something that we pull out of the cupboard in times of need. It's kind of like that safety harness in your car that if you're in a car crash, you pull out faith and cut the seatbelt and break the window. But that's not the intention of what faith is. And this is really the audience that he was writing to in the book of Hebrews. Again, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. The whole reason it's in the Bible is because many believed at the time that it was Paul. But now we know most likely it was not Paul who wrote this. But as he's writing about this subject matter of faith, he's writing to a community that is significantly oppressed and discouraged. And as he writes this definition of Hebrews 11.1, 1, we have to go backwards to understand what the context is to this definition. A couple verses right before, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38 and 39 says this, But my righteous will live by faith. My soul takes no pleasure in anyone who shrinks back. Again, the author is quoting another verse. But we are not among those who shrink back and so are lost, but among those who have faith and are saved. The key word there is shrink back. See, a lot of us, when we try faith and are left discouraged or injured from it, we tend to shrink back from that faith journey that God's called us to live on. We tend to get discouraged and we become reluctant or hesitant to live out faith. But again, this author is writing, we must be those that live by faith. And this really is the anchor verse of all the Bible for faith. It's often the most quoted. It comes from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. So here's Habakkuk. He's sitting down in this quiet time praying for his community that's in rebellion. And this epic word comes to him. And God says to write it down. And the beginning of this word that God gives him is that, there it is in Hebrews, or Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous will live by faith. And it kind of gives us an insight as to what faith is. It's not something we try. It's something that we live by. One author writes this, that faith really is like a vital organ in the body. Physical eyesight produces conviction or evidence of visible things. Faith is the organ which enables us to see that which is invisible. So what the author of Habakkuk is talking about is that faith really, it's like the eyes that we see with. We have to use them to walk and move forward, to know where we're going. It's something we can't live without. But I believe he also gives us some insight into what opposes our faith or what tends to interfere with our faith. And I love the way the message writes this. Eugene Peterson translates it like this. Look at that man, bloated by self-importance. Full of himself, but soul empty. But the person in right standing before God through loyal and steady believing is fully alive. Really alive. See, our faith is what gives us the life that we're called to live. But pride gets in the way of faith's full venture. See, our pride, our self-reliance, our self-importance, our self-allegiance, our self-assurance tend to get in the way of living what a life of faith looks like. Because how many know? When you're called to do things that model faith, they tend to look foolish. Faith isn't cool, calm, and collected. Faith is often irrational. See, God, as we look throughout the story of Scripture, when there's journeys of faith, there are often journeys that many of us would not take ourselves. See, faith is this invitation to do things that are uncomfortable, Without the clear result of resolve or results that will come from them, faith is this journey, an invitation to trust God no matter what the outcome is. And again, being, I love being in churches where we believe in healing that God speaks today. You get exposed to some crazy stories in these environments. Crazy story I heard quite some time ago was this man named Mike Bickle, who's a leader of the House of Prayer in Kansas City. And he had this man that was a prophet in his church. Now, we believe everybody can prophesy, but there are those <clears> that have particular gifts of prophecy. I got water right here. I saw that, Marky. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> there are those that have particular gifts that can hear on God's behalf in, in extraordinary ways. So he has this prophet in his church, and this prophet would give words from time to time, but again, was one of those that would say some strange things. 
And one day, the moment is very serious, and Mike is preaching in his church, and a real somber moment. And out of nowhere, this prophet stands up and says, macaroni and cheese, and sits down. Well, Mike's furious by this. Because, I mean, if there's any moment that's going to break the moment of preaching, it's a macaroni and cheese prophecy. So Mike tries to recover from that. And again, this is not a license and permission to ever do this in this service, please. So Mike gives, you know, finishes his message and is walking very sternly towards this man to correct him. Well, Mike is cut in front of by this woman that is just hysterical and says, I haven't been to church in years, and I came here today. It's my son's birthday, and he died many years ago. And I just said, God, would you show me a sign that he's with you? And every day after school, I would make him macaroni and cheese. And I knew that God spoke to me that day. There are things that faith calls us to do that we do not understand. And like that testimony or that of the iPod, we don't often know the result of those things that God calls us to step out in faith with. But the thing that interferes with faithful living is the pride that we all wrestle with. It says in Proverbs, the fear of man is a snare. We wrestle with the fear of man. We're really insecure. We're really concerned by what people think about us. Now, what's unique about Hebrews 11 is this anchor passage that many of us point to as the heroes of the faith, but the way the writer wrote it was actually quite controversial in his day. Here's what some scholars write. He says, a catalog of heroes of faith introduced as patterns of imitation is unthinkable in Greek tradition. The reason for this is to the formally educated person, faith was regarded as a characteristic of the uneducated. Those who believe something on hearsay without being able to give precise reasons for their belief. The willingness of Jews and Christians to suffer astonished pagan observers. This fact constitutes the note of offense in this section. So this list of faith of people that do the audacious and insane things is this unique Jewish model that they would look to, people that would do ridiculous things. Where in the Greek culture, where many of those now would be reading that, they would think to themselves, these are just foolish examples. See, and engaged with a process of humility, that if you're going to live a life after God defined by faith, you're going to have to humble yourself. And say yes to things that are going to seem ridiculous and embarrassing to many. And this is the theme of faith. Faith is used over 24 times in the book of Hebrews. And we go back a little bit further to Hebrews chapter 6. He talks about this promise uh, or this processes of imitation, of following after these leaders. He says this, so that you may not become sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So he's setting up this community that's in persecution, saying, don't lose hope of the promises that God has given you. Don't lose sight of it, but follow these examples in which he gives this amazing list shortly afterward. But the key word in this verse is the word sluggish. He says, don't become sluggish. Now, few of us here would admit that we're truly lazy, but all of us suffer with laziness. We're just really good at excuses that point against that we're not lazy is what we do. We come up with lists of things that we do and how busy we are or seemingly look busy. You know those people that walk around like they're on the phone, but they're really not talking to anyone? Some of you are here. I apologize. <laughs> However, when you're walking and moving forward and, you know, we try to look busy, but what he's really confronting is this issue of laziness that a lot of us suffer with. The, the lazy life does not live to a, lead to a faith-filled life. But what's unique about the word he uses for sluggish, it's not just laziness that we, we would know, but it's lazy in hearing. It's those that are slow or sluggish in hearing, hard of hearing. And it really leads us to one of the main themes that a lot of us reference to how do we mature or grow in faith. Paul says this in Romans chapter 10. For faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Now, the context Paul is talking about is reaching unpe the unreached people groups and talking about the confession of Jesus. But we know this, that there's this word of God element where we have to be listening to God's word. One of the famous verses we quote from Hebrews is Hebrews 4.12, that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. 
Now, our reference point tends to be Scripture. We point to the Bible, and I wish I had my Bible this morning. My kids like to play church, and this is the second time they've played church and not recovered Dad's Bible, so it's here in faith. But we have these physical Bibles that we point to, and that's the context of what we think is the Word of God. But the word, word is actually the word rhema, which is a living word. It's the creative working power of God. See, in the context of the writer of Hebrews, he says you have to be hearing and listening. Hebrews chapter 4, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion, but listen to the voice of the Lord. You have to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying, and it speaks about this relationship that we have to have with God. We have to be listening to what he's saying. It's not the old revelation of yesterday. We have to live on what the word is today. It's the picture of manna, fresh bread. Yesterday's manna will not cut it. What God is speaking today is essential and important. But yet at the same time, there are these words that he speaks to us that are really not fulfilled yet, that we have to hold on to with trust. We have to trust him. And our journey of faith is so human. Oftentimes, God will speak, and it feels like we're walking in the middle of a dark room. Like we're walking on a journey where there's no light. There's no way for me to see the path in front of us. That's really the picture of faith that's more accurate. It's this journey where we see dimly in front of us. But we know this, the word of God, as it says in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. See, his word is essential, both reading scripture, knowing scripture, but also listening to his voice. It helps illuminate the path in front of you. And if you're in a season of confusion, where it seems like there are things not clear, ask for the word of God. Get clarity on the word, or for him to confirm the words that he's speaking to you. I remember several years ago, my dad was committed to hike Half Dome. How many have hiked Half Dome before? And so my family was very focused on this, and we trained for this. And I had uh, just been married. Our, my wife was pregnant with our uh, new baby girl, Sienna Rain, at the time. So we're there, my brother and I, and my dad, we were committed to go to Half Dome. We invited some friends with us. And my dad had heard about a special trail from our friend Mountain Mike Shreve called the Sunrise Trail. It was supposed to be an easier trail. It was smoother pathways, and you could then go to Half Dome and walk back in the same day. So we wake up at sunrise to walk on the Sunrise Trail. We take a picture next to the sign, the Sunrise Trail. But as we're walking, the journey continues to go longer than we thought. And the reason why they call it the Sunrise Trail is because it literally takes you all day to get there. Now, we were not prepared for this. We all wore shorts and T-shirts and expected to be back like the normal half done trip up in about 10 hours up and down. Well, we're there and the walk is long and we keep seeing half dome in the distance. But as we're walking, we're walking, we finally arrive up to half dome. My dad has now a swollen tendon in his knee. Difficulty walking, we're delayed. It's about to be sunset soon. We have no cell phone reception. I get to the top of the mountain of Half Dome, I call my wife to let her know that we're not going to be home when we thought we would be home that evening. So I get a hold of her. I'm like, hey, Rachel, it's Brandon. She's like, I can't hear you. I'm like, hey, babe. And next thing we know, we lose her cell phone reception. So my pregnant wife has no idea what's going on. All she knows at this point, moment is a panicked phone call from the top of Half Dome. When we go down, the sun is starting to set. My dad's knee is swollen. We're with our friends, the Muzios, and we're walking back. Then my back seizes up. And I'm carrying this backpack. It's cold at night. It's half dome. There's bears. At least you assume that there's bears. <laughs> and we're walking through this trail, and I'm complaining. I'm just angry and mad and cold and wet and sweaty. Well, now at this point, it's just pitch black. All we have is the moon of the night to guide us. And then my good friend Ken Muzio says, I think I have a flashlight. And he pulls out one of those awesome, headlamps and puts it on his head and we are guided this whole journey in the middle of this forest by this baby little lamp down this dark pathway luckily ken led the pathway little did we know he was kicking out bear poop in front of us because bears were around at that time that night we arrived back at our car at 3 a.m hiking all day exhausted thinking we're going to die now if it wasn't for that little light, we actually would have missed the turn we needed to take. There was another group we were with, and they did not prepare. 
and they decided to stay back and take pictures. Because they didn't have the light, they took the wrong path home and almost died of hypothermia that evening. That little light saved our lives. It's the little light of the Word of God that guides our path. That little light that helps illuminate the path in front of us. And at seasons, we expect this thunderous Word of God to come. We want God to shake mountains for us. You know, we want God to split the skies. We want the Old Testament words of God, I'm going to throw a fleece out and dew's going to come. And then dew's not going to come, but on the grass around me. That's not how the New Testament journey is. It's this little faith that comes from time to time. And the best picture of the little voice is when Elijah's on the mountain. And God comes with a wind and a fire and this earthquake. But it says God was in this still small voice. It's the little lights that God places in our life that help guide us on our journey of faith. Because if it wasn't for those little lights, guess what? We probably wouldn't need God. It's the trust. It's the reliance upon him. And our faith at times, how many are with me? Our faith feels little. It feels small. It feels insignificant. Now, we tend to romanticize faith. We tend to make faith sound like this amazing journey, and we stepped out. And again, whenever we tell stories of healing or miracles, we want to tell you the struggle alongside of it. Very rarely are you in moments when you pray for someone, and you're like, I got this big time. Everybody step away. I'm in control. No, that's all of us. Aaron, Alex, my friend, just shared another story. Everybody feels trepidation when you're about to step out of faith. But there are these moments in Scripture where we have the acknowledgement that someone's saved or healed by their faith. It's the woman with the issue of blood, the centurion who needs his child healed. And there's an acknowledgement of this great faith that is there. But then there is this term we find in the Bible, O ye of little faith. And what's unique about this is Jesus only uses it in reference to his disciples. He never uses the term in reference to people that are just there to call upon his name. How many can recognize this? There's those mo miraculous moments when you call upon the Lord before you know him and he shows up. You have all the faith in the world. And the moment you say yes to Jesus, man, your faith feels fragile. You're on this journey of little faith. It's this word immature faith. And it speaks of their need to rely upon Jesus. So what do we have? We have the disciples in the boat. And as they're in the boat, the storm comes. And what's his comment? Oh, ye of little faith. Peter walks on water, starts to freak out, little faith. Matthew chapter 16, talking about the leaven of the Pharisees. Jesus says, they start talking about bread. He says, can you guys not get it? How little your faith is, how dull your hearing is. And finally, it goes to Matthew 17, whereas there's this boy who has epilepsy. Now, at that time, they believed that epilepsy was caused by the moon goddess. And this moon goddess would come and afflict your child. So there's some weird pagan beliefs going on in this family as this woman brings her child to the disciples. The disciples try to cast it out. No luck there. They bring it to Jesus. And he, again, if you read the story, he uses this phrase, wicked and perverse generation. It's hard for us to understand, but most likely he's speaking to the pagan beliefs of the culture where they've kind of infused it with the word of God. But as he says this, heals the little boy, relieves him of the affliction. The disciples say, why couldn't we cast it out? And he uses this phrase in regards to their little faith. He said, only if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, say this mountain moved from here to there, and it would do so, and nothing would be impossible for you. The main symbol we tend to use in reference to our achievements of faith is that if we only had faith the size of mustard seed, we could move mountains. Now, I don't know about you. Any mountains been moved lately? No. See, this is what we have to understand. We've made it this achievement, but what the Bible starts to say is that faith is not this measurable source. Faith is not something that we can quantify, and it's hard for us to understand what Jesus is referencing, but it's really this audacious claim that leads to a later on passage in Matthew 18 where he says, with God, all things are possible. This is what he's leading up to. This is what he's teeing the ball up to, is that without relying on God, you're not gonna really see a lot of results in your life. Now, the equivalent to this today is faith the size of a mustard seed. If Jesus was speaking in a lecture hall today, he said, faith the size of an atom would move a mountain. That's the context. 
of what Jesus is talking about. He's referencing the smallest item that they would understand at that day. Jesus is not given a scientific lecture at that time. Well, really, how we understand faith the size of a mustard seed is in Luke 17, a similar passage here. And as he starts to talk about the disciples, he's sharing with them the need to forgive. And he's talking about if someone sins against you, forgive them seven times in a day. And the result of the disciples hearing this command is, in Luke 17, Lord, increase our faith. That's what he says. Lord, increase our faith. This is what the disciples declare. He then says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this tree, move, and it'll be cast into the ocean, and nothing will be impossible for you. Again, this is a parable. It's a strange saying. They're left confused, not with clarity. And as they're there and they're confused, understanding what is Jesus talking about, this mustard seed and trusting in him, he says, listen, it's like a slave and their master. And he shares another strange parable that would have made a lot of sense then, but it's hard to read now. And here's the gist of it. He says, listen, if there is a servant in a household and he's commanded to do something, don't you expect it to be done? Same thing it is with you. You're my servant. I'm your master. Do what I say. And what he does is he combines faith and faithfulness. What we've done in our culture is we've disassociated faith and faithfulness. They were always cohesive thoughts in the Bible. We never feel like we have miraculous faith, but we can live faithful lives. And that's our call. That's our command as believers. That it's those small, simple words that God says, those little tiny things that he leads us with that light our path. And he says, will you be faithful to what I said? Faith is not this romantic journey where we just step out and sell everything we own just because that's what the Bible says to do. But it's this journey of following the small voice of God to say yes to things that just seem ridiculous at times. And will we trust him? Because the reality is our faith is fragile and so were those of the early church. Their faith was not heroic and miraculous at all times. But one thing they all held in common is they believed that God was the rock that they built their life on. And as a result, we see these major themes in Scripture is that our faithfulness comes from God's faithfulness. We're able to live faith-filled lives because God is faithful to us. Deuteronomy 32, it says this, that he is the rock. That's a good name right there. His work is perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God without deceit, just and upright is he. I love the definition of faithfulness here. Trustworthy, honest, to remain motionless. See, God is constant. How many of us are inconsistent in our lives? Just be honest. We get lost in emotions. One day we're saved. One day we don't know if we're saved. We live these disruptive lives that are like roller coasters, but the one constant thing is Jesus. Jesus is constant. He's consistent. And guess what? He can put up with your inconsistency. He's bigger than your moments of doubt. And one of the things we get lost in is we think, man, someone would have been healed if they had enough faith. Man, if they, if they just trusted God enough, maybe the outcome would be different. That's not a biblical thought. It's a cultural thought. See, the journey of faith, they never would have even thought about faith being something you could quantify. It just wasn't a normal thought process. It meant belief and trust and reliance upon someone. And the outcome was dependent on the person you were relying on. That's the journey of faith. So when you try to define faith, what is it in the end? Faith is faithfulness. Faith is trusting in God even though you don't know the outcome nor see the outcome. But in the end, we know he works all things together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. That's the journey of faith. And as the author of Hebrews writes, just a few verses backwards from Hebrews 11.1, 1, verse 32, Recall those of earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. How many in a hard struggle with some suffering in their life? Sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse and persecution, and sometimes being partners with those who were treated 
For you had compassion on those in prison. You cheerfully accepted the plundering of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves had something better and lasting. Do not, therefore, abandon that confidence. Abandon that faith that brings a great reward. For you need endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. We need endurance. We need to stay faithful. Don't be discouraged and disillusioned in this season. But allow community and others to come around you and support you when your faith feels fragile. About nine years ago, my wife and I were exposed to an opportunity in Ethiopia. Some friends here that were part of that journey as well. There was an orphanage that uh, started as these YWAMers were saving kids that were being sacrificed to a god in the Omo River. And as we got word of this, we went out to help. At the time, one of our missions directors went out there and said, hey, there's really not a lot of resources for these tribes that are in need. And this young YWAMers that now have nine kids that they've saved. So as we were there and working with them, the only way to save the kids was adoption outside of the country. So as we got word of this, I, I simply just went to a meeting one night. My wife said, we should go to the meeting. And my mind is, she's my wife's pregnant. We're not going to adopt any children at this time. Adoption will be a later on in life process that we engage with. Well, we go to that meeting that night, and God starts to speak. He says, I want you to, to reach out and start to trust me. So we start going through this adoption process. As we're in this long adoption process, they say, you're going to need a significant amount of money. Well, you know the salary of a youth pastor at the time is just crushing it culturally. So... No need of finances at that time. Well, we're trusting God. We're praying. Okay, God, we need you. We barely make it month to month. We need you to show up in a significant way. Well, first deadline comes, $3,000. Small donations come in. Now we're up to the next deadline. It's a $10,000 deadline. God, we need you to show up. We need you to show up. It's the day before we need the $10,000. Once we get the $10,000, we find out which child we will be matched with. We get a call from my mother-in-law. It says, random things happen. We have sold a property that was owned by our distant relative, and you're part of the inheritance line. Uh, we're going to wire $20,000 to you. Okay. Needs met. Now we have what's needed. We paid the money that we need to pay. We're matched with this little boy named Abraham. Here's, his name. Here's a picture of Abraham here. Do we have that? It's towards the end. There he is. Little Abraham. This is quite some time ago, nine years ago. Well, as we get this picture, we're crying, we're trusting God. And what's unique is I was on a walk many months prior. And I was walking and praying. And I heard the Lord say, you're called to name your first son Justice Abraham. Well, that day, we went in for the test of my wife to find out what the gender was. We found out it was a girl. And I thought I missed God. But little did I know there was a little boy in Ethiopia that was named Abraham. They were going to name justice. So, moving forward, we're up to the edge. We have everything we need. We're waiting to buy plane tickets. We get a call saying, we're sorry to share with you. The orphanage is being shut down immediately. All adoptions have stopped in Ethiopia due to corruption that's taking place in different orphanages. We're like, well, wait, what does that mean? We'll just wait. They said, there's no waiting. They dispersed the orphanage. Everything was shut down in a matter of weeks. Now we're left in this place with all these promises, all these finances, all these things. And this is this journey that we all move forward in and as believers. And we're disillusioned and angry and mad. And now this kid's going to grow up, you know, traveling around, not knowing where he's going to be cared for. We prayed for him daily. Well, our friends, the Haynes, had this little time share in Tahoe. We called them. There's another story we don't have time to get into. But we call them and go out to Tahoe. And as we're there, we're about to make that turn as you see the great valley in front of you. We turn and it opens up and God speaks to my wife and says, it's going to open up in just a minute or just a moment that you would least expect. So we make the turn. We're down there. We're praying. We're reminded of this adoption agency that we had gone in touch with, some friends adopted from. We call them and have this real great connection. And they say, because of all of your paperwork that you've done, you're able to transition to a private adoption. Now, there's a problem. Private adoptions are very expensive. You say, well, how much? It's going to be about $30,000. Well, we'd already lost 10. We have about 10 left. We need 20 more. 
So we're there, we're praying, and we're saying, okay, God, if you want us to do this, you got to show up. Get another phone call. Another inheritance has come in from a distant relative for $20,000. It's a pretty good year, two and one. So we say, okay, obviously God is passionate about adoption. We move forward, and we get a phone call. We get picked, and we adopt this baby boy upon his birth day. His name is Justice Jaden. Here's our boy now. He's seven years old. See, this journey of faith and what we thought was a simple adoption turned into a complex adoption. But now we have two sons. We have a son in Ethiopia and a son here. We will probably never be with our son in Ethiopia, even though I met him and spent time with him. But we pray for him. And God knows the journey of those individuals. Even though we don't know the outcome, we trust him in the process. This is the journey of faith. It's not this miraculous belief and these warm, fuzzy feelings that we have all the time. It's will we remain faithful to what God has said. We trust him regardless of the outcome that we desire to have take place, but what he will ultimately have come to pass in the end. This is the journey of faith we're all in. Let's stand together as we pray this morning. I'm going to invite up my friend Aaron. Just as we uh, were praying, I really felt this morning not to have a testimony, but just to spend a few minutes here, I want to invite the worship team up, and just, just pray. I feel like God wants to reawaken some promises that maybe we've lost hope for. Maybe there's some areas in your life that you need repair or healing or restoration in. This is that moment where we say, God, I call upon you in faith and I will trust you. I will trust you for the journey. I will trust you for the outcome of what I need. So let's just close our eyes here. Father, we just thank you for faith. We thank you that you would change the cultural definition of what we know faith to be, that you would redefine it for us, that this journey of faith would be our consistent and humble walk with you. God, we ask for those that may feel discouraged. They've been walking in disappointment where they've lost faith to believe for promises you've given them. God, would you bring them back to life? God, that we would not lose hope, but we would understand just like you writ to those at the time when this letter was written, there was persecution on every side. But God, when those pressures come against us and those promises seem like there's no hope left, God. We say our hope is in you. Our faith is in you. Our trust is in you. For with you, all things are possible. God, we pray for restoration of families where there has been significant brokenness. And just right now, with your eyes closed, you're in a place where your family life is significantly fragile. And you need God to show up in a miraculous way. Just lift your hand up if that's you right now. Father, we pray for family fragility to be made firm and restored in Jesus' name. God, that you would restore those areas of brokenness and hurt and pain, that they wouldn't feel like at any moment it could come crashing down. But God, you are the one that can make us strong in this season of fragility. God, we pray for those that have lost loved ones. God, where there's even been some vows made that if I believed enough, enough maybe the outcome would be different. God, we just break agreement with those lies and shame and accusation of the enemy. God, it's you alone that produces the outcome. God, we choose to trust in you like small children would trust their parents. God, that we enter the kingdom by coming with faith like a child. So God, would you come and help? And just even now, where you've experienced significant loss in your family and you thought it was because of lack of faith, just lift your hand up. If that's you, Father, we pray for healing. Healing in the hearts where we acknowledge that, you know what? We were young in our belief, but God, you are faithful to restore and bring healing. Thank you, Lord.